This episode of Talking With Tech is brought to you by Smartbox, assistive technology that inspires you to be who you are. You can find them at thinksmartbox.com. Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Duber, joined today as frequently by Chris Begay. How are you, sir? I'm so excited to be here today, yes. Me too. <laughs> this is going to be a fun one. This is going to be exciting. And of course, by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm doing really good. Excited as ever. Really great topic today. So I'm pumped. That being said, let's just uh, jump into it. So one thing that we talk a lot about on the show and that hopefully people are talking about generally is the concept of modeling in AAC. So what is modeling? Anyone want to take a stab? Well, I think in the terms of AAC, it means modeling on the student's device or modeling on a system that the student is using so that they can learn the language. Uh, just like a typically developing student learns from hearing and, and watching people communicate around them, you have to communicate using the student's device. I don't know, is that a good way to put it, Rachel? Yeah, no, I think that's great. I always try to tell people that AAC is a visual communication modality. And so, you know, we can't just use auditory only. We have to show them how to use the device. We have to show them those motor plans for getting to their words. And it's such a huge piece of the puzzle. And it's, it's the most important piece. If they can't navigate and they can't find the words and they don't see how to use them in meaningful context, then, you know, we're not going to get very far. So as a framework for this conversation, we're going to be looking a little bit at a specific research article, which was Sam Sennett, Janice Light, and David McNaughton in 2016, um, who looked a lot at, uh, basically they constructed a review of modeling intervention research and, um, and the results from that. And it's a really helpful guide. I encourage you to take a look. But for this purpose, we're going to be looking at that. And we're also going to be discussing one distinction, which is the idea of instructional modeling, which is when you're sitting there literally showing the words from a specific piece of curriculum versus naturalistic modeling, uh, you know, which is in, in running conversation, essentially. So with modeling, the, the first thing we think about, I guess, is the who, right? And so specifically, we're talking about kids with complex communication needs or CCN, sometimes it's abbreviated. Why would a child with complex communication needs require modeling of an AAC device instead of just exposure to oral language? So I think the, the first thing is, how else are they going to learn it? And the other thing to consider is they don't have as many people modeling for them as someone who's speaking. So someone who's speaking, everyone around them is, is talking and they're listening and they're learning from everyone who's around them. But when you're an AAC user, how many other people are in your environment using the same system you are? So it's often limited, and so you don't have as many people modeling for you. That's what I'm trying to do all day long. You know, not only impress the importance of modeling, but just kind of figuring out systems that facilitate it and natural routines that you can start integrating. Because I think that's the hardest part is, you know, I know how important modeling is, and I have to remind myself during sessions, like, oh, I should have modeled that. You know, it's something that has to be kind of always in your mind and we have to teach caregivers and communication partners how to integrate modeling into language lessons, into home routines, you name it, language happens everywhere, but we really need to make a conscious effort to make it visual and do that modeling. Yeah, you know, I think you touched on something really important there, Rachel, is that I see my role as a coach on how to model because conceptually, oh yeah, I'm supposed to model, okay, but actually practically doing it, it can be difficult. It's sort of like learning a foreign language, right? I think that's even in the article that it's, you, it, to make the analogy to people, it's like trying to learn Spanish or French. Uh, that how would you do that? Well, people have heard that expression before. Well, how, what's the best way to learn Fran French is you go live in France, right? Because um, then you're immersed in it. So same thing. What's the best way to teach a communication system is you have to uh, you have to know the communication system and use it with students. Create an AAC world and go live in it. <laughs> This is great, and, and I, I think there's, we'll, we'll get here in a moment to a bunch of the specific strategies, but so we've covered the who, right, which are these students that aren't going to acquire uh, oral language, or at least not in the, in the developmental you know, trajectory that we would expect, and then the why, which is that it'd be very rare for most of these AAC users to see an adult using an AAC device, and certainly not at the frequency that um, we're all exposed to oral language. There is, and Chris, you touched on this, that's, that's great, that there is this sort of ambiguous, like, well, modeling's great. Well, one thing that's great about this article is that we go into 
specifically why it's great. So some of the, the outcomes of this in terms of actual language skill acquisition, um, you know, are pretty specific. So we think about pragmatics, right? You know, after modeling, we see an increase in turn frequency, which would be how often an AAC user is, is essentially speaking during interactions. Uh, we see an increase in vocabulary size as a result of, of modeling, specifically aided language stimulation. And then there's also this, this grammatical piece, right, of uh, longer utterances, more words, and more use of these, these little fiddly endings, like ing's and the plurals and, and this other stuff so what why is all that stuff good i mean maybe it's obvious but let's say it i think the the big one for me is that pragmatics piece you know we need to teach how to have conversations and that's what modeling does because it's not just requesting at snack time it should be a conversation and i think a lot of times in the classroom it's hard to kind of have those conversations because it it feels you know a lot of times like there's a lot going on and and so I think that if we're doing more modeling and we're teaching communication partners how to do more modeling, it just, it's a natural transition to more communication because both people are speaking the same language. Now I'll jump in on the morphological part, the morphemes, right? Those little uh, uh, parts of speech, right? Uh, so there's two concepts here that I like to touch on when I'm trying to do that coaching part, part is that first, when you're looking at the actual system, do they have those on the system? Like if you have a piece of paper, where is ing on there? Where is the the the, the plus s to add a uh, where's the ed? And if often those systems don't have you know, like a piece of paper doesn't have that. So when you're selecting, are you thinking, well, someday they're going to have that, right? So how do I how do they learn it if we don't start modeling it as soon as possible? You know, I I have this little visual of a little baby and I put all these ings around it like burping and you think. How did they learn to put ing? It's because people said those words all the time to them. So how else is the, is the student going to learn it unless we do that with them on their communication device? That's one part of it. The second is I ask people to think of each uh, word as a language unit, not just word. Each concept is a language unit. So every word is a language unit. All the morphemes are language units, ing, ed, plural s. And then I want you to picture those as a sand timer, right? But each one of those is a different sand timer. And what you're doing every time you model one of those is you're putting a little tiny grain of sand into that sand timer. And eventually, it's up to thousands and thousands of times of modeling, it gets to that halfway point, and then it starts to spill over into the top part of the sand timer, and that's when the students start to use it, right? You're feeding the receptive to bring out the expressive. I love that. Totally. Scary. Yeah, that you just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's such a great idea. You know, it's such a visual, you know, representation of exactly what we're doing. And I think the thing I love about it the most is that think about how many drops of sand you need to put in before it spills over. So, you and know, every, it's, not, it's not something that happens right away. Yeah. And every time, every opportunity that goes by that you don't do it is a little kind of sand that you didn't put in there, you know? So I, I think that helps. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, that's I, this is actually an excellent segue. So we've we've talked about the the who, right? We've talked about the the what and the and the how. What's the what's the where? What is what's the context? I guess for appropriate modeling, um, is this something that happens thirty minutes once a week, right? With an SLP, I'm seeing some no's. No, I heard a laugh. It, happen, it happens all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, language is everywhere. You can talk all the time. We all do it all the time. So I think that the important thing is the device needs to be, you know, with the child all the time and it needs to be being used all the time um, and showing how we would use it. And I think that, like Chris mentioned, we're coaches and how can we coach these communication partners to feel empowered that, you know, it does matter and it is important. Um, something that I come across a lot because I work primarily with kids with autism and oftentimes it appears as if they're not paying attention. Um, they're not attending to the device. They're kind of not looking at the device. And so a lot of therapists uh, that I work with and teachers are like, you know, they don't, modeling, we don't need to model because they're not even looking. They're barely looking at their device. They're not attending. And, uh, you know, my response to that is, first of all, we don't know what they're attending to or not. So often I think a child's not attending and then they, you know, respond when I'm like, you were listening, you weren't even looking at me. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, we can't just use that as an excuse not to model. That's really dangerous territory to get into. And we just have to presume that kids are 
Do you guys come into that a lot in your practice? Okay, so another analogy I use, that little baby that we were talking about before that you're holding in your arm, do you wait for them to start talking before you start talking to them? No, you, you, they're not attending necessarily. Their eyes aren't even open. You're, you're modeling to them all the time. So why would you do the exact same thing for students who use AAC devices? Something else you touched on very specifically was, um, hey, how do we get them? I think this is a common frustration for speech therapists. I know they should be modeling and I try and go into the classroom and I try and tell them they should model. And every time I come, they're like, oh, here comes Miss Rachel. We got to get out the device real quick, right? And one strategy to help with that is to actually develop a table and work through the system where it, this is that coaching piece. Say, okay, uh, the first column of the table is uh, times of day. And the second column of the table is uh, language opportunities. And the, the third column, we're going to leave that blank for right now. So then you look at the segment of the day is morning circle time. Well, okay, we're, what are we going to do at morning circle time? We're going to do weather bear and put the hat on and take the hat off. So let's plan that out. We are going to focus on this core vocabulary word or whatever the word might be, um, or even the language unit. Maybe we're focusing on ING, whatever. We're going to plan that, and we're going to do that for each part of the day. We're going to fill out this chart together. How many opportunities can we build in to model ING or on or whatever the target might be through each one of those parts of the day. And that last column that we leave blank, that's to tally it all up. And we say, can we get to, what's our, what's our goal? Can we get to 200 opportunities? Uh, you'll find that you can get to that really quickly. Can we get to 400 opportunities in a day? Let's challenge ourselves. Last week, guys, we got to 200. Can we get to 250 this week? You know, and it, make it a game for people. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting coaching model uh, strategy for people to use. Something else that I uh, do with some of the communication partners that I work with is remember those like clickers. So I have them take a clicker and I'm like, all right, how many times are you going to model today? And like you said, it's like a game. It's like, you know, oh, we got to 200. Like, guess how many I got you last week, Miss Rachel? Like I got to 300. So I think that, you know, it, it just goes to show that we have to empower and coach. And also that what I find from that exercise is that people's minds are blown. They're like, wow, like I could do it so much. It was so easy to get to that number. Because it, it sounds like, wow, 300 or 400 models in a day feels unattainable. But it just, you know, it just goes to show that language is happening all the time. And it's really easy to get to that number. And just that the actual, like, having the number is enough to motivate people to keep going and to stay accountable, which is half the battle, I think. Today's show is sponsored by Smartbox, makers of speech generating devices carrying their signature AAC software Grid3, which is one of the most popular worldwide. Grid3 used to only be available for Windows, but now with Grid for iPad, the options for continuity across platforms have really opened up. For thousands of kids and adults around the world, using Grid3 gives them the ability to really participate in all forms of communication with as much control as possible. Grid3 does that by seamlessly incorporating everything from literacy curriculum to text-based grids, all while having access to social media, photos, movies, phone calls, all in one place. All these features of Grid3 evolve with the person while they communicate, participate, and be who they are. From iPad to eye gaze, Grid3 is an incredibly comprehensive AAC solution. Go to thinksmartbox.com for a free 60-day download of Grid3. It's one of the great options to consider for every person needing AAC. You know, the other obstacle that, that I think SLPs will hit is trying to convince the classroom staff or the families that this is something that, that is important, right? Especially in the context of this larger hierarchy of needs. You know, you know, we hit on this last week a little bit, but maybe the student has complex medical needs. And there are absolutely opportunities to model constantly throughout the day. This is not a circle time thing. This is not a snack time thing. This is uh, something that can, you know, that can be happening constantly. And it actually, it becomes pretty second nature. You know, I've seen people that can play lamp like a piano, which always blows my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite there yet. And granted, it does take some training and some time to become familiar with the student's device, but it's absolutely worth it. And, you know, you will understand more and more about that student's com uh, communication capabilities as you do so also. So what are some other ways we can get folks to buy in? 
Well, okay. So here's one concept I like to show is some end user videos. Like I, I use Chris Klein as an example, like users who have put themselves out on in social media or uh, have videos of themselves. And then it kind of draw a parallel, like look what these people can do. How did they do it? Right. They'll, they'll tell you, listen to this guy, talk about it. He's going to tell you how he, he people modeled to him and that's how he learned. And so that's how we're going to do it too. Right. I love that, actually. And I think that we're always kind of focused on the minutia. But when we see the, the finish line, it's enough to keep people motivated and show them, you know, this is what we're working towards. And, you know, look how successful this can be. And I think that that's a, that's a perfect example of being very visual. I think people are very visual. I like to show, right? I think people learn best by showing. So I'm constantly modeling how to model. Um, so I go into a classroom and I kind of embed into a activity with a teacher and I'm showing, look at all the different words that I can model. And, you know, I'm modeling not necessarily with expectation that anything's going to be imitated or the child might not be communicating. But I think that showing versus telling is always uh, a better strategy um, because I think people can learn so much better from a, from a model. I'll take it one step farther, Rachel. So first you tell, then you show, and then you do. So the next stop is, okay, I've done, I'm showing you how to do it. All right, now you come over and do it and I'm going to watch you. And then we're going to reflect on it afterwards. And I think there's some research that supports that model of breaking uh, those, the, the skill down for the communication partner into smaller segments. So we're not talking about an hour long segment. We're talking about maybe five to 10 minutes of, of watching you do it. And then, okay, now you come do it and now let's reflect on it. That's fantastic. Okay. There were some folks that I worked with uh, a few years ago, uh, Marco Peters and Taylor Telkamp, they came up with this incredible curriculum called DIGS. It, it, the acronym stood for discover, meaning to find a new skill, right? And then integrate, uh, meaning to incorporate it into the context of the lesson or the material, generalize to start to use it in the larger social context, and then share was the last one, which I, uh, you know, harkens back to what Chris said about, you know, these experienced AAC users that are then, you know, being the model um, for the emergent one. So, Okay, so we, we've talked about the who, we've talked about the what, we've talked about the, you know, the why, um, but, you know, the, the, I guess the big thing is how, right? So I think people tend to think that modeling is really hard, and um, I guess I kind of don't. I've always thought it's kind of fun, um, but what, what, give me some examples. What are some contexts or specific, uh, you know, scenarios where modeling can be integrated easily? Well, I think it can happen all the time and across every activity. Um, so I see kids in multiple environments. So I can see them at home. I can see them at school. And I think one of the best ways to help communication partners and caregivers is figure out routines that modeling can be easily integrated in to start. Because I think that one of the problems is we're like, model all the time, all day long. And that feels very overwhelming and daunting to uh, parents and teachers. And a lot of times they're just getting used to the system and where all the words are. And so it's just like, whoa, I don't know if I can do that. And then what I find is then nothing happens. And that's the worst possible scenario. So I think that just showing and, and integrating into those natural routines, you know, like bath time, um, turning the water on, there's very easy, you know, language that can be modeled during these routines that parents are probably saying, right? And I always tell that to parents. I'm like, you're already saying this verbally. You just need to say it on the device. So we're, we're really doing that aided language input that kids need. And same thing with teachers. You know, it's usually easy to integrate into snack time to start and then, you know, start circle time and these kind of naturally structured routines, um, showing them what that would look like first. And then, you know, I find that once caregivers and teachers, they get comfortable with that, then, you know, they're able to expand and they're able to kind of start doing, you know, what SLPs probably do naturally, which is model all the time. I think another strategy to help with caregivers and uh, parents is to connect them with other caregivers and parents. Uh, there's plenty of blogs out there and just Facebook groups where people are sharing their experiences. And so it's like, well, their family is kind of like my family. I, they're doing it. I can do it. Hey, how'd you do it? Oh, I can do it like that too. Uh, so I think that's another strategy. But another, another one I think is to coach the, the families, specifically siblings, if they are, if they're there. So can we teach the siblings how to use the device? Because that's, that's even more people in the environment for the student to learn from. Sibling models are the best. And peer models, too, in the classroom. I think that it's just, you know, we know that kids respond so much better to peers, so much better to kids their own age. Um, so if we can integrate that into our therapy sessions and show, you know, especially siblings, I'm always up for that. I think parents are always kind of like, no, no, it's, it's their speech session. Like, you know, and I'm like, no, bring them in. This is their life. Brothers and sisters are around. 
So let's teach them about the device and teach them how to, how to use it and how to model on it. One more thing, we got to throw it into the classroom perspective, is that if children are going into the general ed classroom, or even if they're not, even if they're in some sort of self-contained setting, and not every student is using that communication system, most of the literacy words are the same words. The sight words are the, are the core vocabulary words. So why not use the system to teach reading, not just the student with AAC, but to everybody? And in fact, I've heard stories of teachers who the AAC user has left their classroom, you know, graduated on, moved to the next class, and they continue to use the AAC system like up on their interactive whiteboard. They're like, why, why wouldn't I, you know? And they make it a, a whole community approach. So let's, let's talk through some of the questions that seem to consistently come up for people. So one of them is, for example, do we have to model every word? Does it have to be perfectly grammatical every time? How does that look? My recommendation is always kind of take where the child's at and then model one step above. So, you know, if the child's using single words, model two words. Um, you know, with the caveat that, you know, there's no like hard and fast rules, right? Like if I am in a situation and I want to model three words, that's better than modeling no words. Because I think that sometimes we kind of give all these recommendations and parents feel like, I don't want to do it wrong. And that's another reason that they don't do it. So I think that we have to be careful when we're giving recommendations because sometimes people get really intense about, well, it was only supposed to be two words or you know what I mean? But generally speaking, that's what I recommend. If a child's at a single word level, I always model just a step above that. And it's the same thing, right? Same thing with, with kids who um, we work with who aren't AAC users. Well, you know, Rachel, you used the analogy of a step. You're going to be one step above. And so I'll take that even a little bit further and say, what if it was an entire staircase, right? So we draw a little staircase and say, the student's on this step. So you're going to stand on the next step. And if this was a real staircase, you wouldn't stand at the top of the staircase asking a little kid to, to walk up the stairs. Come on, dude, get up here, right? Come on. And uh, you, you'd be one step ahead of them or maybe be on the same step and this, you take the next step up and you have them by the hand and it's the same thing. I also think it makes it a little easier for people to wrap their brain around the modeling when they don't have these long utterances. But it's okay. That's, that's exactly where we want the kid to be if that's where their language level is. I'm making an assumption because that's the majority of kids that I work with are at that sort of uh, one to two word language level. But, uh, you know, it makes it easier for the communication partners. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, they're kind of the, the adults are learning the systems too, which is an important reminder, right? So I think that keeping it simple, especially in the beginning, is important. Once upon a time, I was putting together a presentation that I was going to do with a very famous um, researcher and uh, person in the AAC field. So I had a slide and it had, uh, don't teach the articles, I had A, and and the, and I put a big like X over them. You don't need to start there. You don't need to do it. We'll get to there eventually. That was the point I was going to make. And the, the, this person looks at me and, and says, as we were reviewing the slides together, he's like, really, Chris, are you the man or are you a man? And I was like, oh yeah, they're kind of important. I guess there is a distinction there whether I'm the man or a man. But still, I don't think we need to teach them right away, right? Like, do you throw them in there? But and I thought, well, maybe you would model it. Like, you wouldn't make an and the a target core vocabulary words. I don't have a good answer. I, I, I'm still uh, on the fence. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I think that it, it's case dependent, right? I think that um, some kids are that I work with are so good at watching my models and then imitating them. So I'd be more inclined to use those articles with those kids. Um, for other kids, I feel like they, they have a really hard time with abstract concepts and I don't think there's anything more abstract than articles. Um, you know, just these, these fillers that we added before words and all these rules that, you know, kids eventually have to learn. Um, so I think it just depends. I think I'm, I'm less inclined to start incorporating articles because really I'm just trying to in the initial stages you get more bang for your buck with some of these core words versus articles but I do think there's an important place for them and especially uh, when it comes to you know modeling them I think that's good yeah maybe we wouldn't have an expectation that the student uses them right away but maybe we should be modeling them especially if again back to the research article that we were talking about earlier one of the components was syntax that syntax right so mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this famous researcher person has a good point yeah. Well, speaking of syntax, um, actually, I get that question a lot because oftentimes when kids start using, uh, you know, two words, they will confuse the order. And especially the ABA therapists are like, whoa, no, we don't say cookie eat. And, you know, I'm just excited when kids put two separate concepts together. I'm just like, yeah. 
um, you know, we can get there later. And of course I model it back. Oh, you want to eat the cookie? So I think that it's important that we will get there eventually with the, with the syntax and the morphology, um, and the articles. But I think that for me, I just am excited when kids put those two concepts together and, you know, right. start formulating, you know, beyond single words. Well, and I think we can do like like you said. Like I, I don't know if it's I don't know if this phrase is used really in 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 our world, but in the English as a second language world, the the phrase recasting, right, or the, that we um if we hear an errored utterance to repeat it back errorless without correction or judgment, but just mm -hmm. you know to provide that model. Now I'll tell you in practice what I often do. I this is a tough question for me because I am really motivated by the developmental literacy piece. And I'm historically a linguist and I'm, I, I want to jump in and say, oh, articles are so important and in some languages they are morphology and, and it's, a, you know, it makes, it's a huge difference. But, you know, we have to think also about the opportunity window that we have for those teachable moments, right? And, and I don't have time always to sit there and, and create the grammatically perfect utterance. And so what modeling often looks like for me is that I'll be sitting there you know, picking out and using the keywords or the, you know, the, the core words, or maybe it's fringe for a specific context and, and using those often pretty much verbs and nouns, but then still orally providing the full model. So I'll be mm -hmm. sitting there talking saying like, oh, this movie was great. And maybe my output on the device is movie great, something like that. But at least I'm, what I'm trying to do is time it with my oral utterance so that we're doubling down. And um, I don't know if that's the right approach, but that's, that's what I find myself doing. Just to, to kind of add on to that point, I think that it's really hard to expect for kids to constantly be using all of these words. I think sometimes it's easier to say movie great. We get it. We get it. I get it. When you say movie great, oh, you thought the movie was great. A lot of times it's hard work formulating these sentences and creating them. And so obviously we have to balance that as speech language pathologists because we have to teach you know, we have to keep expanding and showing how we could use that language, but I don't always require that of kids because I realize how time intensive it can be to use tons of words. Oh, well, I like how you said it, uh, Lucas, without judgment, right? So you just accept it without judgment. I think another concept there too is the concept of descriptive teaching. So the idea is that when I'm modeling, what I'm really going to do is just describe what I'm doing as the communication partner. And so when I'm doing that, I'm providing the, the, the proper pragmatics and sy syntax and semantics. And if someone does it wrong, then I'll just model the right way because I'm just describing what I'm doing. That also helps with the communication partners wrapping their brains around what, uh, what they have to do. I mean, I just, I go sit down, I type, I sit. That's right. You just say, I sit. And then when you go to take a bite of the apple, I just say, I eat. And it's like, yep, you type, I eat because you're just showing him what you do. On whose device are we modeling with? Are we using the student's device? What does that look like? It depends. That's my answer. Because I have some children that I work with, they will not let anybody touch their device. So for kids like that, I'm like, okay, I got my device um, so I can model on a separate device. But it, it depends. I think that some kids are very open to you modeling on their device. It also depends on are there more than one device because sometimes there's not. So then we have a lot of limitations. Um, what do you think, Chris? <laughs> this this feels like um, dangerous waters to, to to wade into. But here's 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 what I think. Uh, I really think that it depends. <laughs> Just like Rachel said, um, I know some students that they would wouldn't care less if you. I mean, they're attending, they're uh, they're in the activity, they're using their device, and they'll let you type type on it all day long. Uh, they let you press the buttons on it to model. There are other students that they have ownership of the device. So it's kind of like, let me go over and tickle your lips if you're talking, you know? It feels <laughs> weird to, to, right? Like, That's you funny. would do that to somebody. So, um, so I get it. You own it, dude. So I, you know, you hold it. And I, in that case, then I need a second device, you know? I'm fortunate enough in, in that I have one you know, but many classroom teachers don't. And so uh, this is when we start looking at like, well, how do they get them, you know, and, and families can get them. And uh, I think it's important uh, to, to, for, to, to look at the different financial structures of how that might uh, work out for people. Another uh, really easy hack that I do for, you know, families or classrooms that don't have two devices is just take a screenshot of the homepage and laminate it. Make a low-tech yeah. version. Um, really easy way um, to just 
be able to model. Um, I think that's a good practice anyway. Um, even if you do have two devices, just having it kind of everywhere. Um, for parents, it's like it can be in the car. It can be, you know, you always have a backup. So that's an easy yep. hack. Yep. Yep. I Rachel, mean, go, go ahead, Lucas. No, no, no. Go. Well, I, I just along those lines, one thing that I've done in a lot of households is take the symbol set from the communication system that they're using if they're emergent communicators and label the house or label oh, yeah. the playground. You know, put put that symbol for slide on the slide so that when you're at a recess, maybe the device doesn't come along because it often doesn't, that you can say, oh, you chose slide, you know, those sorts of things and just re reinforce that symbolic knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and you know what I think there, so two two thoughts. First one, Rachel, when you were saying you laminate the, the, the boards or ask classroom teachers to do that, uh, we do that too, uh, and I do that too. I also think of having a giant poster up on the wall and um, depending, like let's say it's uh, Lamp Words for Life or Pro Local, things where you, ha you can put like little sticky notes that say, when you press this button, it takes you to all these other buttons, right? And so I, I have actually tweeted pictures like that because I've walked in and seen teachers like, hey, we have these little sticky notes up on. So that helps people, one, own it, and two, um, learn it, you know? Uh, once they write it on the little sticky note and they stick it up there, then they know that thirsty's under drink, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but back to what you were saying, Lucas, I think... Um, you know, plastering the, con the, the, the environment with the icons is a strategy. I would use it, um, I'd, be, I'd be curious uh, about the reading abilities of it. So I think there's some research that says um, by Karen Erickson that talks about how when you're trying to teach somebody to read, assimilating the, word, the, the words, I mean, putting a picture over the word actually makes it more difficult. So the way I think of it is, you know, before I learned that a little, uh, that an S is an S, it's just a squiggly line on a piece of paper, right? And so it wasn't until someone taught me that that's the s sound and that it's an S that I learned that that little squiggly line meant something. Sure. Well, if I added a squiggly line and then I put something above it, it has more squiggly lines and it maybe has a little color in it, that makes it even more complicated, not less, you know? Um, and so I think what, what you're getting at with using the environments, uh, putting the symbols in the environment is not necessarily for the student, but it's for the communication partner. So, oh, right, there's my little, uh, that's how I get to thirsty. It's that little, oh, that's where it is. It's under that folder. Well you know? put, sure. No, that's great. That's actually, that's funny because I did this uh, not too long ago in an elementary school and the feedback I got was that all the L2 students were then using the icons to navigate the school and, and, and find things. And, and now, now you, you've given me concerns. Uh-oh, I better follow up on that. I wonder if I'm, I'm harming literacy. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, okay. So that's an interesting concern. This would be something that, uh, that we could discuss. Well, and this goes into a, a, a even broader conversation about fading icons and when we should do those sorts of things, um, which I, you know, I think is totally appropriate. It's so nice now to have so many systems that have things like cloud saves and backups so that I can pull in their device if I need to, uh, to mirror it on a second iPad. You know, I also, uh, you know, just personally have a, a few different um, communication apps on my, on my phone at different levels uh, so that if I have like a new assessment or something, I'm prepared at whatever level the student, um, you know, is at to, to do a little modeling, even maybe potentially before they have the device. Uh, one of the pieces of advice I'd give people listening is, um, if you don't own a student's, you know, app, or if you don't have access to a, you know, some more device, reach out to the company. If you tell them that you're looking to, uh, you know, to get a copy for modeling um, very frequently, I think folks will, you know, accommodate that. Hey, Lucas, I have a quick question for you about sure. modeling. So I don't have as much experience with eye gaze as maybe you do. I, I get the impression you've worked with eye gaze users. Do you use like a laser pointer at all or anything like that? To How do you do work with eye gaze? That's a really great question. So, you know, it's funny that you mentioned, so we used to use laser pointers um, up until a few years ago. And the, the issue is now with new, newer LCD screens and, you know, God forbid, OLED screens, you know, the new technology, the laser doesn't show up very well often. Um, so there's there's a few different things that I'll do. One of them is simply gesturing and pointing to uh, the screen without obstructing the eye gaze sensor. Um, okay. You know, that's one way to do modeling along with this, you know, the same sort of oral output piece. Or, you know, it's, it's, uh, pretty much all the systems now, or many of them anyway, I mean, certainly anything um, from Toby or, or Cough Drop, folks like that, um, you'll be able to then also have an iOS uh, build of the same, you know, grid or solution, smart box, same thing. Um, you know, so, so what you can do is you can then pull that in and, uh, and still be modeling off, you know, at least to the side. So at least they're hearing the synthetic voice piece come out, even if it's not in their field of vision. 
Um, there's still ways to do it. I mean, this it's not as ideal, um, right? But, you know, hearkening back to a point that Rachel made way back about uh, students that maybe aren't attending to the modeling, I mean, we, I just sort of view it as the same situation. Infants in utero can identify their mother's voice. So, I mean, even without attending, it's, it's certainly clear that the, the input is, is reaching its, its desired location. So uh, there's, there's different considerations for modeling. I mean, it's not practical to sit there and set up a whole second eye gaze rig, but uh, if you can at least have a mirror of it or indicate on their screen or, you know, just get a printout. Uh, you know, like, like Rachel said, I've done that before. I've even just used plexiglass, you know, from Home Depot for four bucks and gotten like a three by four sheet and taken a magic marker and drawn a grid and just stood behind it and modeled that way. There's a low cost hack for you. <laughs> it's sold in the shower section. <laughs> go, to, go to Home Depot. So we've talked about um, pretty much everything here. We fit the, the who is these, you know, obviously the students that we work with with complex communication needs. Um, you know, the why is the fact that these students are not exposed to language output in the same way that they are going to be producing language. So it's critical to give them that exposure. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the, the, the what's in the hows. Um, what are some final thoughts? We just need to impress upon the importance of modeling, right? I mean, and that's kind of what we do, but there's... I think after this conversation there, we hopefully gave you guys a lot of ideas on how to, to do that, how to be a good coach to those communication partners. And I, I love the idea from Chris about the end user, um, showing them what that really looks like, because I don't know that everybody has seen a very successful AAC user. Oftentimes, you know, you, a teacher starts with a kid using a device and it doesn't look like it's working or it's being successful. If we can show what that success looks like. It gives a clear vision as to why we're doing it. Well, and along those lines of showing success, I mean, if, if you're able to, I mean, one thing that I love to do is just like, I'll just put my, my camera in a corner and make a video of myself modeling for a time with a student and then just share that with the parents, you know, so they have an, an image of how easy that can be. And this is, I mean, this is a little silly stuff. Like we'll be watching SpongeBob or, or whatever, you know, just sitting back and, and doing what I said I was doing. I'm like, oh, that was fun. This was neat. Oh, did you see how, you know, he was on top of the car, you know, whatever it might be. And then modeling those keywords. I mean, it's, it's um, it, you almost fall into a routine doing it. I think my final thought would be that when you're coaching communication partners, what you really need to think about is that it's a skill they need to learn. It's not just something they're going to suddenly, you know, miraculously understand because you talked to them about it once and maybe showed them that cute video that uh, on aided language stimulation, you know, it takes a skill on how to do it. Um, and so uh, breaking it down into small parts and making it manageable and realizing those skills build upon each other. So um, I'm going to teach you how to uh, sit and read with this student, and I'm going to model during reading. And then I'm going to sit with you, and I'm going to uh, talk about least to most prompting on a device. And then, uh, and, and I'm going to do it, just like uh, do it, and then I'm going to ask you to do it, and then we're going to reflect on it. I think, those, I think that's my big takeaway from the discussion about how to teach communication partners how to be better models. And then I guess one last thing I'd throw in there is we didn't mention the Jane Corston quote yet which is kind of a famous, famous yeah. quote. Um, I, and I, I wonder, do we, do we say it or do we ask someone like to put it on Facebook? Could we challenge a, a listener to put the Jane Corston quote, if they know it, uh, up in our Facebook group and see who's like the first one to put it up there? Hey, I like that idea. Ooh. Whoever's the first one to put it up there, I will get you a free copy of an app with like $20 value. That'll be a <laughs> challenge. Love it. Well, this was fantastic. We've hit on a whole bunch of stuff. I think one parting thought for me is just that um, for so many typically developing children, you know, language acquisition is like a happy accident. It sort of happens unconsciously from, um, you know, being immersed in an environment. So what we need to do is we need to, you know, we need to be mindful about how we create that same immersive environment. But we also it needs to not overthink it. I think people get really intimidated, um, you know, thinking about everything that's entailed in modeling. But really anything that you're doing on an AAC device, uh, uh, you know, as a model is um, probably going to be helpful. We would love to hear your feedback, um, so let us know what you think. Uh, you can reach us through Facebook. There's a, a page and a group. If you, if you search for us, you'll find us. Um, same thing on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, we would love to, to hear anything that you have to say. If you like what we do, please do take a moment, stop by iTunes and leave us a review. Um, that helps other folks to find us because that's really the, the mission of this thing is to get good information out there. And other than that, we're just so grateful to, to have such a wonderful community. We got great questions this week. We really appreciate it. Um, some, some wonderful feedback. It makes us 
feel uh, valued for spending our hour or two or three or six a week uh, mm -hmm. doing this thing. And um, we're just, uh, you know, so grateful to be in a profession where we have the opportunity to impact lives the way that we do. So thanks for listening. Once again, this is Luke Stuber for Chris Begay and Rachel Madel. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>